Right now, if you currently have one client that's past due, you could be using QuickFee to get the immediate benefit of freeing up that cash flow. Stay tuned to hear more from our sponsor, QuickFee, later in this episode. This episode of the Cloud Accounting Podcast is sponsored by Accounting Suite. Accounting Suite offers exceptional cloud accounting software that includes a robust set of inventory management tools to track inventory levels, orders, sales, and deliveries from anywhere at any time. Accounting Suite even handles multi-channel online sales. In one integrated dashboard, you can control inventory, orders, and sales across various stores at the same time to avoid product outages and lost sales. Accounting Suite lets you start out with just the features you need today, and as your business grows and needs change, you'll have the peace of mind knowing that Accounting Suite offers an upgradable path for your firm and company's future. Accounting Suite is offering Cloud Accounting Podcast listeners 50% off forever by using promo code CAP underscore 50 underscore 2020. Head over to cloudaccountingpodcast.promo slash ASUITE. That is cloudaccountingpodcast.promo forward slash A-S-U-I-T-E. This episode of the Cloud Accounting Podcast is sponsored by OnPay. OnPay is an easy-to-use, full-service payroll that's the right fit for all your clients, whether they have just one or 500 employees. They handle all the complicated stuff like agricultural payrolls, Form 943, multi-state, and H-2A visas. OnPay even makes it easy to switch from other payroll services by doing all the data entry for each client that you set up. Right now, Cloud Accounting Podcast listeners can get three free months of OnPay payroll service. To learn more, head over to cloudaccountingpodcast.promo slash OnPay. That is cloudaccountingpodcast.promo forward slash O-N-P-A-Y. Welcome to the Cloud Accounting Podcast. I'm Blake Oliver. And I'm David Leary. Another week, David. Yes. It's uh, very eventful for me. I got bifocals. And so that way I could actually look at my phone. And then this morning I dropped my phone and cracked the screen. So now I can see my phone very crisp and clear with my glasses on. And now it just makes the cracks in my phone screen really, really stand out. So are you going to stick with Android or are you going to buy an iPhone? Oh, I'm sticking with Android. Are you kidding me? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to buy my Chinese Huawei phone too. I hear those are really affordable. You know, must be subsidized by the uh, Chinese government spying on you. Value for the dollar, man. Well, uh, what's new with me? Yesterday, I did my second webinar with Jarav on CPA Academy. It was very exciting for me because um, I've been at that drive now since October. And I've made it my mission since then to actually learn how to use the product, which is financial modeling. And I've always wanted to be able to do financial modeling. I've never done it. So that was part of the reason I joined the company is selfishly just learn how to do this cool thing that all the CFOs I've ever worked with have been doing. So in order to actually make that happen, because it hadn't happened, I was getting distracted by so many things. I scheduled a webinar where I would have to build one live so ah, for, for like public accountability. Right. So I had no choice. I should have tuned in for that. I shouldn't have missed that. Well, you can watch the recording. I'll put the recording link in the show notes. And uh, it was called How to Build a Financial Model for an Accounting Firm. It's very basic, basic monthly bookkeeping, build out the revenue model and then the staffing plan and do drivers to relate those things. You can do cool things like uh, for every 25 clients, you need to hire a new bookkeeper and you can do it two months in advance of that. And then building out the OpEx and the CapEx for their laptops and some simple stuff. We couldn't do a lot in an hour, but it was really fun to actually do it. And it forced me to learn how to do it. So is that, is it, would this be a technique you suggest like when people are like, oh, I need to train myself how to do advising of clients. Like just go get it. Just show up to a client and start doing some advising. Even more than that, I use the mad scientist approach for everything. Ever since I started doing bookkeeping, my background was not in accounting. It was in music. So I had to teach myself everything about bookkeeping. And then I went to school for accounting. But when I was a bookkeeper, I had to learn it all myself. And so what I would do is I would buy the software or join the partner program and then set up the account for myself. And when it was when I didn't have my business, I used my personal finances. So I'd put myself personally on the software and then reconcile my accounts. That's how I learned QuickBooks. That's how I learned Zero. And then when I had my business, I would just plug that app into my business. So I'd start using Expensify for expense reports, or I'd start using Bill.com for paying my own bills. And then I would see how it actually worked. And that, in my opinion, is the only way to really master something is to either use it for yourself or use it for a business you're working on. But I always prefer to use it for myself first because I don't want to screw up my client's process if I don't know that things going to work right. Oh, I, I completely agree with you on that. I mean, that's my big learning over the last 
18 months of being on my own small business journey is, you know, moving from using apps in theory or playing with apps or putting fake data in apps to moving my real money through these apps and that in my real data through, through apps. And it just changes your complete tolerance level and your point of view on it. That brings me to my retirement plan or my business after the podcast, right? Once our podcast becomes so successful, you know, we're just like filthy rich. Uh, <laughs> I want to start. Is this, is this a 2020 plan or is this a 2022 plan? Like, how soon is this going to happen? Head, you're head of business development, so you tell me. But uh, I want to set up an accounting firm, maybe my own CPA firm. It would be in a retail location, and the office would actually be like a coffee shop. Like, you know how they have Capital One has those bank branches that are now like coffee okay. shops and you yeah. sit down? So it would be a coffee shop, fast, casual kind of restaurant situation. And people could come in off the street. They don't have to be clients and they could eat and they could have coffee there. But clients could also come and work. So it'd be kind of like a co-working space. And then the reason I want that element of the coffee shop food is that I could have all the apps running that business. So I could try out all the point of sale systems in my own subsidiary of my firm. Or, do, you, do you know what I mean? Like I could actually demo the software. I totally get that. I, I, Clay Notes uh, told me a story. So he's down in Australia and, and I do the same thing. When I see different point of sales, I ask the restaurant employee like or the restaurant owner, you know, pay you like that app you're using or the point of sale, whatever they're doing, right? I talk to them about their tech. I guess Clayton did that with a restaurant owner about some point of sale. I don't even know, right? And the owner, the restaurant owner was like, yeah. And because I figured out how to use it, I have a whole side business. I've implemented in like 40 other restaurants and they all paid me to implement it, <laughs> right? And so you're right. Like, like because you're using it, you become an expert on it. And then you have a little side. So this guy is, is there, he's in the restaurant business, but he had a whole side hustle implementing this restaurant software because nobody else knew how to implement it. That's great. So all you have accountants and bookkeepers out there, Create a small business. A side hustle. A side hustle so you can actually really understand the pains that your clients are going through. So like if you're a brewery CPA, that means you got to start brewing beer and selling it as well so that you can implement the point of sale in your own, in your own business. CPA, IPA. I think it's been done now a couple of times, but I, I, I've been wanting it to try it. It should be a real brand, you know, like not just promotional. Promo yeah, anyway. that's true, true. Permanent brand. Enough about random business plans and dreams. Let's talk about what's going on in the real world. And I think we got a review, right? We did get a review. Um, but before we go away, I, I do have something about your dreams. I, I could tag on. That's okay. actually news from a tweet. So there was a tweet that went out from, his name is Hunter Walk, H-U-N-T-E-R-W-A-L-K. And his tweet had a really nice graph in it. And his tweet says, the number of Americans working from home full-time has nearly tripled over the past 20 years. The trend is accelerating. So it looks like we're at 3% now. And 20 years ago, it was closer to half a percent. Yeah. Exactly. So I just, I know your dream is like more people working from home, more people working remotely. You know, we're, we're, we're well underway. I, so. I am working from home today, David, and I am business on top and pajamas on bottom. It's the best. I have to work at home to record the podcast because it's the best quality studio here in the closet. Exactly. Cool, so. so, all right, we can jump into the reviews. I just want to, like, that was, that was a news thing that was really to your dreams. <laughs> all right. Well, and we got two reviews. So uh, I'll just read the first one here. The headline is 2020 Predictions. Loved this conversation. I am usually nodding my head in agreement. Got to participate in your podcast at QB Connect 2019 in San Jose. Hope we can reconvene in 2020 to follow up on pricing value, etc. I am now a fan just like at Mary Hamilton. Smiley face, star emoji. And that is from I Heart Smiles via Apple Podcasts. Thank you so much. And we have another review related to predictions as well. This is on um, Podchaser. This is from... A-A-S-S-A-S. -S -S -S. Asas. Asas. This person actually gave us predictions in the review. So it's five-star review. I have a few predictions of 2020. Accountants will become more app advisors giving zero or QB app add-ons advice against a small fee. Secondly, vendors will start emailing receipts just like how Squarespace, or I think he meant to say Square's cash machine app works. Um, and he thinks a world pace uh, sum up will ask for an email at the point of sale as well. Mm -hmm. So, which I, I argue every single SaaS app needs to be emailing receipts out. Oh, it's Please. great. I, I hate the ones that don't do it. And I have to go get the receipt, download it, then I'll upload it to auto entry. It's a, it just email me the receipt and it saves me a bunch of work. Yep. Um, <laughs> clients will start to use you should, zero. David, you should tell that to zero because they, they email a link and you have to go in and download your invoice. You, they don't just email you the invoice. 
QuickBooks didn't either until I uh, until recently, and and I publicly bitched about it because it, I'm like, why do I have to, like it was annoying, right. right? Send me a receipt that I can enter in. Um, clients will start to use zero QBO or zero or QBO themselves more and use accountants for advisory and compliance work. So this person sees a shift back into DYI mm -hmm. right, with the accounting systems, and then he said, I hope you like my prediction. I really enjoy listening to the Cloud Accounting podcast. Yeah, thank so you. So, Asas, thank you. Last one. This is also on Apple Podcasts from uh, G. La Follette. So, uh, these guys are the real deal. So, I've been around the accounting technology world for a very long time and launched the very first podcast in the space way back in 2005. Big thanks to my friends Randy Johnson and Doug Sleater for making Intersection Live so much fun. We thought it was good back then, but quite honestly, it pales when compared to what David and Blake produce week after week in 20. 20. Smart, funny, insightful, edgy, occasionally even snarky, but always interesting and pretty darn accurate. Cloud Accounting Podcast is high on my list of weekly must-listen programs. Just a hint for the guys, you know we're going to stop using the term cloud accounting, right? In the future, it will just be accounting. I didn't really future-proof the podcast very well when I named it, did I, David? Well, I, I think we got a 30-year run possibly here. <laughs> That's my bad. <laughs> Thank you so much, Greg LaFollette, for listening. It's a real honor, actually, to have you listening. And um, for anyone who does not know this man, he is probably the ultimate thought leader uh, from the AICPA, CPA.com. So I think he was like number two on the – when uh, County Today did that list of influencers, yeah. that all the influencers say who's the most influential, I think like he's number two yeah. of what all the influencers think. So. so really, really cool. So David, what do you- and Hopefully this is real. It's not fraudulent. Like somebody's not just pranking us, right? Like this is a real deal <laughs> uh, review. So what, what, what's top of mind for you in the news this week? Well, so we had, uh, what do we have? We have a big, huge acquisition. Visa bought Plaid for $5.3 That's a big uh, deal. That happened. Uh, Intuit is shutting down access to Chronobooks unless you buy QBO Advanced. So that exploded and there's a you know, <laughs> firestorm online about it. I have some opinions on that. Yep. So some some banking type stuff, open banking, more open banking news. But I think those are the two big ones. The uh... So for me, I've, I've got this article. Uh, the headline is just the best. FASB is the villain in accounting today that does a, such a good job of explaining everything that I feel is wrong with FASB and uh, accounting regulation right now. So, And did you write this under a pen name? Is this your article? No, I wish. But okay. no, this is, this is great. Uh, another update, uh, Expensify has a new uh, feature in their Expensify card to help donate money to people in need, which I thought was interesting. We'll talk about that. Walmart is automating their warehouses in their stores. It's pretty futuristic. And then I'm kind of worried that uh, we're headed to another really bad stock market downturn or recession based on the Buffett indicator, which I just learned about this past week. This has been a theme of yours, this uh, like go short on the market, like things are going to slow down in the economy. Like You've been detecting different uh, articles that are pointing that direction. Well, you know, I'm just – it's the – Expansion has been going on so long, it's it's inevitable. Now, I don't think you should take your money out of the market because I think any good wealth manager or financial planner will tell you that you have to stay in it to win. Uh, and if you try to time things, you're not going to fail. But yeah, I'm, I'm a little concerned based on this indicator. So we'll talk about that. And then finally, the new Finnish prime minister has called for a four-day work week. For everybody in the globe or just- for Everybody in Finland anyway. Okay. So uh, what, what should we start with? Uh, why don't we just start with uh, the big one? Let's start with the Plaid Visa. So for those who don't know what Plaid is, basically it's it's one of those apps that lives in between your business apps that helps connect, oh, Mint to Bank of America or it, – It's kind of technology that enables all the bank feeds. Right. It enables bank feeds. It enables verification for instant deposits. So you don't have to do like this multi-day thing to verify ACH. Visa bought Plaid for $5.3 billion. That's a lot of money. And why Why is this a big deal? A, the acquisition number is a big deal, right? So that's gigantic. Visa is very hard about pointing out that this is not a short-term game. This is a decade-long thing for them. Yep. So this is a payments consultant. So that, that's this like Plaid's APIs give Visa a new pathway to data-driven revenue streams. Data is the new oil. Uh, on two fronts, right? It's not just the grease that like makes things work together. It's black gold oil. All right. There's value in data. You can sell the data and you can mine it for information. I mean, that's that's the whole history of Google, right? 
one in four consumers now with a U.S. bank account have used Plaid. Uh, if you use Venmo, you're using Plaid. Half of the apps that connect to QuickBooks and Zero are probably using Plaid. If not, I'm more. It could be seventy to eighty percent actually. It might be it might be eighty five or ninety percent. All of you listeners, I I hundred percent believe one hundred percent of our listeners have all used Plaid. They might not know they've used Plaid that they have used Plaid. Huge, huge, huge opportunity for Visa. It's a little scary because like how long. You know, is Visa going to keep an open API mindset? Let's say I'm an app that's using Plaid, but I'm a maybe my app also uses Mastercard APIs, and I'm I'm I'm, I'm I've been using Plaid independently, but I'm also kind of in bed with Mastercard. Does Visa come wrong one day and just say, "Sorry, you don't get to use Plaid anymore because you're also a partner with Mastercard"? And that happens all the time. I mean, I think Walmart did that. They stopped dealing with partners that used Amazon services, um, web services, right? So this happens. And uh, that's a little scary. Is like, my thing is, where is this going to affect the open ecosystem and the trickle-down effect of that? I saw another article related to this is how the, this is, could start the wave of fintech deal making. Right now, there's 60 financial fintech companies between the new neobanks, the lending companies, companies like Plaid and Stripe. There's 60 that are valued at over $1 billion. And this could be the domino that just starts the acquisition of old fintech buying new fintech. It makes sense. The banks are waking up to this whole new world of fintech and they've got to catch up. Acquisitions are really the only way they're going to do it because they just don't build stuff themselves like this. And you're going to have to see consolidation. I mean, the online lending spaces, there's 5,000 players in that. Like there are all the payments players. There's just a lot of players in this space. So we'll see. I mean, right now it doesn't have a lot. Um, there's a slide deck that I'll try to find the link so we can put in the show notes. But you start looking at that slide deck and then the one chart I kind of look at and I'm like, the only thing it's missing is a GL, right? And again, it's like, geez, everybody's like one step away from owning the full end-to-end from transactions to the invoicing, payments, assets, liabilities down to the GL. Yeah. Like that's the last thing missing from the tech stack. And now Visa is a competitor with into it. Yeah. If I were a bank, I would buy a GL application and integrate it along with bill pay into my online banking. I'd own the whole stack. Yeah. Well, I think last year we saw two banks buy two very small SaaS cloud accounting GLs. So you're right. Uh, we're probably going to see more of that. So- you mentioned some of the possible negative impacts of this acquisition. It's a little bit abstract, though, because Plaid is not something that we use ourselves day to day. It's one of those cogs in the machine of cloud accounting. Let's talk about an acquisition that really is making a big difference right now for some of our listeners, which is the Chronobooks acquisition. Intuit bought Chronobooks back in November. And what just happened this week, David? Intuit announced that they are going to shut down... Chronobooks for any external users. So if you're a Chronobooks customer currently paying for Chronobooks, that is going to be shut down and disabled. Unless you are a QuickBooks Online Advanced user. Which in that case, you just get it as part of your QuickBooks Online Advanced subscription. And what is Chronobooks? So Chronobooks will do a backup of your QuickBooks Online data. So one of the things people have always had a a knock against online software like QuickBooks and Zero is there's no backup. Like in QuickBooks Desktop, every day you could back up your data to floppy diskettes or a CD-ROM, put it in the safe, and then and if there's a catastrophe, you could restore your backup. Well, great. For natural disasters, QuickBooks Online and Zero are great for backing that up. But if you have an employee do bad data entry into your app all day, or you have an app, a rogue app, do bad data entry into your app, you can't fix that without manually fixing it. And so there are uh, products like Chronobooks. Remember the for, uh, one of our sponsors, Rewind? So there's been products that have popped up on the market that will use the APIs of QuickBooks or Zero to back that data up so you can restore the data. Now, they're only as good as the APIs available. So there's not 100% to back up because these products don't have all the data exposed through APIs. But in most cases, like if you can restore invoices, the things that people are entering or deleting from your software. That's enough. These these, these tools are really, really pretty valuable, I think. I, I, um, I, I totally agree. And it's gotten a lot of traction. These tools surprisingly ha- are more popular than I think even myself would have imagined. Yeah. And th- this is really impacting um, at least one of our listeners who we know personally is Caleb Jenkins. He uses Chronobooks with his clients who have he calls them clusters of companies, so all these different uh, entities and subsidiaries. He backs them all up, and now he's going to have to migrate to something else, but none of the other applications support that particular type of billing and functionality, so he doesn't know what he's going to do. And uh, you know, he's a, he's a QuickBooks power user, guys. Okay? So like, 
I just the, don't get this. The Facebook groups? Yeah, the Facebook groups are on fire about it. Everybody's complaining about it. Um, and Twitter people are complaining about it. I actually, like, my opinion is Intuit shut down the wrong product. <laughs> what should they have shut down instead? Should, should I explain more on yeah. this? Okay. So well, let's talk about some assumptions we can agree on. Okay. A company the size of Intuit, no matter what decisions they make, a certain percentage of customers are going to be pissed off. Like that's just the fact with everything, right? right? Of course. Uber changes something. Some people are going to be mad. McDonald's changes the size of the French fries. People get mad. You're always going to make – just that's just going to happen. We can agree on that, right? Can we agree too that QBO is the future for Intuit? Yes. Okay. We can agree on that. Can we also agree that Intuit's a public company and they have a financial incentive or obligation to push customers to QBO Advanced? Yeah. Well, to QBO, I, I think the way they're doing it with QBO Advanced is somebody pointed out on Twitter trying to find who said it. The way they're building QuickBooks Online Advance is buying apps, adding them into QuickBooks Online Advance, and then shutting them down. That appears to be the strategy. So it's not like innovating and building into QuickBooks Online Advance. It's like forcing people to upgrade by taking away yeah. stuff from the regular product. Yeah. And so so they're so they're by shutting down Chronobooks, they've pissed off the QBO users, right? Which is your future. Right? Like those users are bought into your dream. They're bought into your future. So you're pissing off your, your, your QBO users, right? And then now what you've done is you've actually pushed them not to QBO Advance, but to go find a different third-party backup program. So my argument is they should have shut down QuickBooks Desktop. <laughs> you would have pissed off a percentage of users, but it's okay to piss off the desktop users because they're not the future. And then, yes, there's options, but the vast majority would just move to QuickBooks Online. If you really want, if you really want to get people on QBO Advanced, yeah. kill QuickBooks Desktop. Like the wrong product was killed here. That's my opinion. Well, David, maybe it's coming someday. There's always chatter every yeah. year that, it, that that Intuit will end support for a desktop. And I'm slightly you know, surprised <laughs> that Intuit did this yeah. too, because if I go back like 15 years ago when Intuit bought PayCycle, at that time they had like two online payroll products, and they just ripped the bandaid off and killed one. And I remember the mantra, it felt like for at least 10 or 12 years in two is like, we will never discontinue and just kill a product like that. And obviously, anybody who is around for that type of history and that learning experience and the blowback from that, like people were in tears from that blowback, like senior managers, VPs that had to go into support groups and um, the online channels, right? And respond to comments and c customer complaints. Those people aren't around anymore. And the bandages were ripped off and they killed the product. What? 12 weeks after they acquired it, less than that. And now the blowback's happening online. This episode of the Cloud Accounting Podcast is sponsored by QuickFee. As you know, accounting firms don't have trouble getting paid. They have trouble getting paid on time. QuickFee allows your clients to pay outstanding fees in up to 12 monthly installments while your firm gets paid upfront and in full. QuickFee was started by accountants for accountants with a mission to ensure that firms are never paid late again. For almost five years, QuickFee has been helping CPA firms reduce their outstanding AR. In fact, accounting firms that are partnered with QuickFee are seeing a minimum of 32% reduction in their AR. Think of your firm. What could you do with that additional operating capital? QuickFee is offering Cloud Accounting Podcast listeners wave signup fees, three free months, and quick setup just in time for your firm's busy season. To join the 1,200 CPA firms globally and over 20% of the top 200 U.S. accounting firms in benefiting from quick free payment plans, head over to cloudaccountingpodcast.promo slash quickfee. That is cloudaccountingpodcast.promo forward slash Q-U-I-C-K-F-E-E. -E. You've already done the work. Quick fee gets you paid on time. So I got another app update from Expensify. We reported on when they released their Expensify card, right? That's the yes. credit card that's like uh, linked to Expensify. So you don't have to take pictures of receipts and then get reimbursed. You actually just spend on the credit card. It syncs the receipts into your accounting system. And then um, no, no expense reimbursement has to happen. Right? It just draws from your account every single day. So... One thing about these cards, these credit card apps, is that they don't have the rewards points that you might be used to. So the question is, how do you motivate people to use Expensify card or businesses to start using Expensify card when they're going to lose out on the, the points that they could be getting, right? Either the business owners or the employees themselves who are getting reimbursed. I kind of liked doing that when I had my business. And I, and I do that right now as an employee is I'll... I'll put a big purchase on my personal card, get the points for it, get the cash back and then get reimbursed. But so it's funny cuz like the, what's always interesting about um expensify announcement 
of a new product is Dave Barrett will write this <laughs> stream of consciousness email. Yeah. Right. And it's I, usually I have a policy. I do not read below the fold. If I have to scroll to read your email, I will not read it. And I always read dates because it's just, he gives like their whole thought process <laughs> on why they decided not to do a points card, a typical points card. And, and really you start following the logic is like, yeah, I get it. Like people are chasing 1% spending hours to chase a little 1% discount. Right. Like nobody, nobody's going, if you're driving your car and a furniture store says 1% off, you're not like pulling over to go buy furniture there. Right. Like the whole, the whole 1% is stupid. It's insane. And it really truly is. And, and that's what we've all, like as they work through this, right. But it's great to read Dave's brain dump about this and what they work through. So, so he said basically that rewards programs are stupid. The benefits are minimal for the amount of work it takes. So instead of doing that, we're going to create this thing called karma points where they're donating 10% of all revenue from the Expensify card to one of five funds supported by Expensify.org, which is their new charitable arm. So depending on what you're spending, it donates to that cause. So if you buy a meal, it'll donate to hunger. Or if you're traveling, I guess that probably goes to climate. So it's kind of cool. And you can just opt into it and... Instead of you know getting one percent back, you're giving back to the uh, community, and it could generate you know millions or even I guess someday billions of dollars. And the other thing that I thought was interesting is the way they even looked at how like Amazon does Amazon Smiles, and essentially what Amazon's doing is when it's all said and done, the average uh, nonprofit gets like a check from Amazon for one hundred thirty dollars or something. Like almost, it's not that it's useful at list, but it is. Like if you're a nonprofit and you get a check for $130, like that is not going to move your needle in any way, shape, or form. And what they've done is instead of letting people specify a bunch of individual charities and then each individual charity basically gets almost nothing, they're they're lumping these together. One's an environmental one, one's for homelessness, one's for like relocation or something. Mm -hmm. What were the five categories? Do you remember? Yeah. So they've got... Homes, which covers the costs of reuniting a person experiencing homelessness with their family, a climate fund, a hunger fund, a youth fund, and a reentry fund, which is uh, – that reimburses the cost of a journey home for an individual just released from incarceration. So they have a fair shot at transitioning back into society. And it's all based on what category of the expense it was. I'm not sure that email is just a blog post somewhere. Right. It's, it's, it's only an email because it would be great to link to that for everybody. Oh, yeah. Well, if we can, we will. Otherwise, we'll link to the product update and you can learn more there. Okay. Um, I have a, a related – since we're talking about expense management article, if you want to do that. So, expense management vendors unite to form and burst. Abacus, Captio, Certify, Chrome Riffer, Nexonia, and Tally a few years ago, um, almost a full year ago, if not two years ago, all merged together to form a new – They were all acquired by a private equity firm that – for what reason we didn't know was buying them all and had not yet combined them. And during this time, we missed it. Apparently in September, Chrome River and Certify actually purchased another uh, similar startup called Emburse. So it's seven apps have all been combined now as one holding company and they're going to brand it as Emburse. Do they want to take on Concur? They have 750 people around the world. Um, they're valued at a billion dollars um, based on all these things added up individually. But I just don't know like... If there's a migration path, because they're all trying to get slices of the market. Right. And are they, yeah, yeah. Like, is it going to become a single app or are they going to stay separate? Like, what is the long term strategy? It, this feels a lot more like a Thompson Reuters or even a Sage type strategy. Acquire a bunch of products and then rebrand them all similar. But it's, I don't know. It's an interesting strategy to, like, I just don't know how, for me being at a big company before, like how you manage and divvy up resources and which one. Well, I'm the important app. No, I'm the important app, right? I've even seen that. You I mean even into it, right? There's resource streams yeah. between QuickBooks Online, QuickBooks Desktop. That's two products. Well, and what happens when the sales teams from the different apps owned by that same private equity company are competing with each other for business? Because which they are, because you go to a conference. I think when we were at Sage Intact, um, Abacus, Certify, Nexonia, and Tally. Four of these companies all had a separate booth. Weird. Yeah, it's it's a weird strategy, but anyways, uh, just pointing that out that they've grown by one more app and now they're rebranded to that app. Any more app updates today? Not on expense management, but I did have a Google made an acquisition of a smaller app called um, AppSheet. Have you ever seen AppSheet or used it? No, never heard of it. So, it, long story short, it can take a spreadsheet like a Google Sheet and take all your column headings and data and then turn that into an app for like your mobile devices. 
it almost feels like a very, very, very fancy Google form. Got it. I guess that's possibly where Google's heading down this path, or maybe like with Airtable, how you can build like kind of more mini apps on top of Airtable. Maybe it's to power, you know, Google Sheets more powerful. But yeah, so they did acquire a product called AppSheet. Gotcha. I just never could really get into it though. These apps that are like are super, super general purpose, and you could conceivably do a ton of things with them. It's it's kind of hard to get into it if you're not a developer because where do you start? Sometimes it's too powerful. Well, and this is a no-code app, right? That's the theory, right? right? It's a no-code app. So yes, I, I might have a spreadsheet set up to track time, clock in, clock out, total hours, employee's name or something. And I'm just, I've been using that spreadsheet. And then I discover AppSheet, I turn it into an app and now every employee can have this on their mobile phone. But I'm, it feels like all the apps that people could make themselves are half-assed solutions of something you just get on on the market. They exist already, right? It might it, well, it, and it might be no code, but it's still you still got to basically build a product, which is just as hard as coding. Designing a an app is hard, but you know maybe Google can buy this and then it's it's a really powerful feature in a, a suite like a Google Apps. I think Microsoft has some things like that. That Microsoft Flow, these like no code app things right. that'll take some spreadsheets and different Microsoft tools and compile them together into a working thing. And maybe that makes the most sense for something like this. Like a Zapier kind of situation, but internally for that, you know, system or whatever for that. Yep. Okay. So we're done with app news. Um, you want to te- talk about why FASB is the villain? Why is FASB <laughs> the villain? So the Financial Accounting Standards Board sets all the accounting laws, if you will, the accounting standards that govern how we do generally accepted accounting principles. And we talked about in the show about how, I think we just talked last week about how I'm a bit skeptical of you know what they're up to and the value of it and we're kind of wasting our time and well even the prediction episode we talked about how there was a prediction of things they were going to do and we're like it's really not that amazing right important yeah exactly so peter margaritas wrote this blog post on accounting today an article on accounting today that is called FASB is the villain and basically does just a fantastic job of kind of summarizing the the main issues right now in accounting and especially accounting uh, as it uh, affects larger companies and and public companies that have to adhere to GAAP. He said that he speaks to CPAs around the country and it's becoming clearer and clearer to me that many accountants and business owners view the Financial Accounting Standard Board as something of a villain. Three different audience members, all mild-mannered accountants at different events have actually said out loud to me, FASB is the villain. After the third time during a keynote at the University of Nebraska at Omaha, I realized I was perhaps onto something. Oh, so, so is this going to now be a trend? Like when you're at a conference and somebody's doing a keynote, if you're in the audience, just yell out, FASB is the villain. <laughs> like this would be amazing. Maybe. Please, please, please. Everybody jump Maybe on Maybe we'll this. start a movement here. I don't know. He continues on talking about how the guidance from FASB is getting more and more complex. In 2018, the entire codification was over 10 thousand pages in five volumes that were more than a foot high. And this is great news, I guess, if you want a job as a CPA or an auditor, but for business owners and stakeholders, it doesn't really add value. It creates a lot of complexity. It's incomprehensible and it it increases costs. We were talking about this like uh, a few weeks ago that accounting standards have gotten four or five times more complex than they used to be 40, 50 years ago. And what have we gotten for it? The author here talks about the book, The End of Accounting by Baruch Lev and Feng Gu. And that that is an excellent book laying out all the problems with public uh, company accounting and the issues you know, with accounting standards really not improving financial reporting the way it could because our economy is changing. The most important things for investors and analysts today aren't on the balance sheets. You're not going to find lucrative contacts with customers, proprietary know-how and employee knowledge, except as an afterthought in the notes. We're in a knowledge economy, but our accounting is set up for an industrial economy. And the example cited in this article that's also in the book, The End of Accounting, is the financials for U.S. Steel. The 1902 financials for U.S. Steel, side by side with the 2012 versions, are almost identical. The financial statements haven't really changed, but our economy really has because we're dealing in intangible assets and then he also mentions the subscription economy and the book by Tian Zuo, um, who's the founder of, what's he the founder of? Zora. And so how, now that we're in the subscription economy, you're not going to find numbers that are important to the SaaS company and gap basis financials. 
You don't see recurring revenue. You don't see customer churn rate, not even the number of subscribers, not in there at all. And those are numbers that are way more important to investors than any of the stuff we report on. So, and, and just one more example here, like an actual example of an accounting standard that makes no sense. ASC 606 for revenue recognition. ASC 606, right? Changing how we recognize revenue from contracts with customers and, and re recurring revenue, like makes sense at first. But then the way it's implemented is with this like 500 page rule book. And one of the problems is that uh, you now have to take the revenue from the implementation phase of a contract. It used to be recognized up front. So, David, if I sold you software with a subscription attached to it and I had you know, a setup fee of a few thousand dollars, let's say it's a setup fee of $10,000 and then I'm going to charge you $1,000 a month. I would recognize the $10,000 for that implementation up front. Now, I have to take that $10,000 from the implementation and I have to spread it out over the expected life of the contract, right? I have to defer that revenue, even if I did all the work up front, okay? So there's a kind of a mismatch there between revenue and expense right there. And then the really screwed up thing is that let's say you churn as my customer. Because I've deferred all that revenue, I now have to recognize it all in the month that I lose you. So we have this perverse situation where you leave and my revenue goes up that month. <laughs> but you've lost the customer. But I've lost the customer. So like it's a complete mismatch between what is happening on the financial statements and what happened in my business. It was a bad thing for my business, but a good thing for my net income. It's bizarre. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't make sense. So anyway, I feel very strongly that this is something we're going to be talking about because this trend is continuing. Businesses are about subscribers. They're about intangibles. and Financial statements just don't, you don't see that. SaaS metrics are not on a financial statement. Uh, you know, how useful is that to investors? It's just not, not that useful anymore. Anyway, go check out the article. And uh, if you have thoughts on this, you know, let us know. If you write a review, you can tell us what you think. We'll read it. It's like a letter to the editor, right? We'll read it on the air. I want to start a conversation. People are going to start yelling this out at keynotes. This is this is coming. I can see it. This is going to be this is going to be awesome. This is my new prediction for 2020. Everybody's going to yell at FASB as the villain at keynotes. All right. If you do that, please, please uh, videotape it and put it up on Twitter so we all can see it. That would be great to see. What do you think you want to jump into next? Let's talk about one follow-up item. Okay. So I've talked a lot about the consumer California Consumer Privacy Act that requires businesses with over... 25 million in revenue or information on 50,000 California residents to do all this stuff. <laughs> like allow me as a resident, a California resident to, to ask you what information you have, download it, and then tell you to delete it. It's creating huge compliance costs. And we now know, well, we have an estimate of what that's going to be. The Department of Justice here in California estimates that the CCPA will affect between 15,000 and 400,000 businesses which is a huge range, up to 50% of those businesses are small businesses, even though the bill was supposed to exclude small businesses from the scope. A related assessment that the DOJ paid for estimated, and this is the big number, initial compliance with the CCPA. The cost of initial compliance is going to be approximately $55 billion, which is equivalent to almost 2% of our California gross state product in 2018. So a single law about California consumer privacy is going to cost businesses, and not just California businesses, this is spread out over any business that deals with California customers, right, and is of a certain size. It's going to cost them collectively 2% of our California gross state product, $55 billion. To track this. It's, it's a lot of work. To comply. And it's going to cost a lot of money. And that's why you were talking about how compliance, a lot of businesses are just saying, we're going to wait and not do anything. And just see what happens. To tell you how complex this is, the CCPA is 10,000 words. The re regulations to go along with it are another 10,000 words. So it's 20,000 words. <laughs> so this is why it's expensive because you've got to hire lawyers to do it. I guess this was actually a fitting follow-on to the FASB stuff because here we are talking about complexity in law and regulation, just creating more barriers to uh, people doing business. Yeah. And it's not, it may not be helping anybody in the long term. Think about it this way. Um, there's actually some crazy potential ways that hackers could use the CCPA. So every business that has data on me, right, of a certain size has to like give me the data when I ask for it. Well, how do they know that it's me asking for the data and not somebody else? They just have to have a reasonable certainty. I, th I think the word is like reasonable that, that it's me. And so a lot of businesses 
are just saying, okay, send us your driver's license and like some other verification. And this is stuff that a hacker might be able to get, a driver's license number and a name yep. and a social security number. So what you can do now, David, is if you want to get information on somebody, you just get a little bit of their personal information enough to, you know. Because they have to give it to you. It, well, and then they'll ha they'll send you uh -huh. more. Uh -huh. So you can basically go around to a bunch of companies and get people's personal information sent to you now because you're pretending to be them. The, the other part of this I think is not well thought out is in order for me as a company to – service you when you do request your information. I can have some sort of database that pulls this information in from all the places I might have your data. So now I've just created a whole new database with your data. Something else to hack. The guys have trying to give you less data out there. I'm going to have to create a bunch more data about you. It's kind of insane because the principle of it is to have less data tracked, uh, have it um, be open and honest about what's being tracked. And now it's just going to lead to more tracking. Yeah. This is going to flop. <laughs> Well, it'll be in California and the rest of the country is going to make fun of it. So that's kind of how that'll go. Well, and what if other states start passing laws, but they're not the same? So now you've got a compliance cost to like figure out the different rules in the different states, just like with sales tax. You want me to continue on this kind of uh, old school thinking? Sure. <laughs> We're at it. Okay. So I have three articles and I can tie them all together in this old school thinking. So uh, one of them is email is the small business's biggest security threat still. So business email compromise, BEC scam, is a cyber security threat to businesses of all sizes. So this is when, Blake, I maybe send you an email. Hey, Blake, pay me this bill. And you just pay it. Right. You pretend to be uh, somebody else. You pretend to be my CEO. Exactly. Right. And we've talked about this incidents in the past, but according to the FBI, more than $26 billion in losses were reported because of this. Um, between July 2016 and September 2019. Wow. And the Better Business Bureau says 80% of businesses that received one kind of this scam in 2018. I've received multiple of those at my last company, and we were only 160 people. And the reason it's happening so much, it's the, it's the biggest risk to small businesses. This is according to uh, Tim Sadler, a co-founder and CEO of cybersecurity firm Tessian. Mm -hmm. um, he, he basically, it's the most significant risk and it's the easiest for fraudsters to achieve. Like it doesn't take much to just send somebody a fake bill. And then there could be a paper bill in the mail. It's just easy to do. And then once that money's gone, it's almost impossible to get. So that's that old school, like email still big threat. Um, should we talk about checks? Well, no, I want to follow on to that. So it's okay, not okay. just email. It's getting more sophisticated. At least three private companies have fallen victim to deep fake audio fraud. In each case, a computerized voice clone of the company CEO called a senior financial officer to request an urgent money transfer. So they're faking people's voices. If you got a call, David, and it sounded like me, and I told you to send money somewhere, like, you probably wouldn't question that necessarily. I just reply back and say, I'm a podcaster. There's no money. <laughs> <laughs> but it, that's, that's crazy, right? I mean, the easy solution for this, it's really easy, is the solutions like bill.com. One layer of approval like, right. is all you need. And until people figure out you know, how to do that, but that's just more work. Right? Somebody's got to figure out how to. But yeah, the, the C, yeah, exactly. You need a notification on your phone and then you approve it. Right? That's the only way to verify this. You can't, you can't go on verbal, on email approvals anymore. It's got to be in yeah. an app. Yeah, especially not an email approval. Like that's actually very, very, very dangerous. You should be very skeptical of that, especially unless if you're not the one who sent the email first saying, can I pay this bill? Right. Yeah. It should never come down the other way right. ever. Um, so it's something to be aware of. You mentioned invoice scamming, right? Sending fake invoices. Yep. In 2017, Google and Facebook were victims of an invoicing scam. They lost $100 million between them to a single scammer. I think we talked about that on the show. Yeah. It's, it's, it, these are ridiculous numbers. Uh, and it's so simple that like, it's very preventable. Uh, maybe Google can build an app now that they have AppSheet, a very simple app that <laughs> looks at all the, all the bills they're about to pay and somebody can tag, tag through there and, and approve them. So sticking on fraud, yeah. there's a rise in check fraud. Oh, yes. That could- Going that up and up for years, trade. yep. It's been going up, right? So check fraud was $15.1 billion in 2018, up from $8.5 billion in 2016. So it doubled in two years. Wow. And so 60% of all attempted fraud against- um, Deposit accounts in the U.S. banks is check fraud. A great stat to tell your clients when you're trying to get them to switch to a digital payments platform. Um, now, check usage is declining, but it's kind of crazy. For as much as check check usage is down um, from used to be 81% mm -hmm. um, in 2004 to last year, it was just 42%. So check usage is down as half, but the amount of fraud is up. 
So it's worse than it even – combining those two stats, you realize it's worse than it, it seems. This could be $30 billion if it was still the same percentage of checks going through. What I liked about this article is there's a, a quote from not an accountant or bookkeeper, you know, or us. This is a quote from Robin Helms. He's the company finance and chief of Hansel Auto Group, which operates a network of car dealerships in California. He said that some suppliers just insist on being paid by check. There's a lot of stubborn businesses that want to operate with checks. <laughs> well, they've got their workflow, right? They don't want that disrupted. So, so it's not just like people like us and cloud accountants and forward thinking people saying, hey, stop using the checks. Yeah. Now, small businesses that have to deal with it are starting to push against it as well, which is you know getting out of that. Um, and then the last kind of stuck in old thinking is a survey by the UK Federation of Small Businesses. It's been two years since open banking has been introduced in the UK. They surveyed a thousand small businesses about their uh, open banking habits, right? Or shared data habits. And what they found is um, two thirds of the people surveyed would not consider sharing their bank account details electronically with other financial providers. Two thirds. And 40% believe it's unsafe. Digesting that for a second. Yeah. So, so this is, this is a country that has government implemented open banking regulations Yeah. and people don't want to do it. The FSB, this Federation of Small Businesses, calling on the UK government and banks to raise the awareness with the community and reassure businesses that the APIs are absolutely watertight. And that's actually really scary, right? Because I'm not saying like, nothing is perfectly watertight. It's very secure versus a paper check. But, you know, for the government and banks to go out and just, I, I don't think that's what's going to encourage people to use it. Hmm. Well, fear is a powerful motivator, either to action or inaction. <laughs> So let's talk about my fear of a pending stock market collapse. I learned about something recently, the Buffett indicator. Have you ever heard about this, David? Is it based on like his liquid assets versus what's in the market? I, I really don't know what the indicator is. Okay. So it's pretty simple. It's the total stock market capitalization of the United States relative to US GDP. So total value of the stock market divided by gross domestic product what we are producing as a country. Okay. So, so some ratio where hey, th th that gets out of whack. Right. Right. So like, how could it be worth more than what we're making? Right. So the idea is that long-term stock market capitalization can't be that much more than GDP because ultimately what are you investing in? You're investing in products being made and sold. So right now it's near an all-time high or it's at an all-time high. Right before the Great Recession – at the end of 2007, the U.S. market cap was 137% of GDP. Just before the dot-com bubble collapsed, the U.S. market cap was at 146% of GDP. On the first day of trading in 2020, that indicator, the Buffett indicator, hit 153%. It rose 14% in Q4, and corporate earnings growth is flat. So the question is, are we due for another significant market correction? This indicator says that we're overvaluing the stock market. So, uh, and, and I guess it's called the uh, Buffett indicator because Warren Buffett uses this as a, a personal way of, you know, determining whether the stock market is overvalued. And he's hoarding cash right now. He has one hundred and twenty-eight billion dollars in cash. Why would he be holding on to all that cash? Well, he thinks the market's going to drop and he's going to buy. Right? Buy low, sell high. That's that's yep. that's Warren Buffett's strategy. <laughs> Or just really buy low and hold, right? That's what he does. And one indicator of this, I, I like that article you found five, six, eight weeks ago about the uh, restatement of earnings and how that's uh, uh, been rising. This like people just restating their earnings after the fact over and over and over again. Oh, yeah, exactly. Um, and maybe accounting has something to do with this, right? Pumping up earnings. Exactly. The company's not really being honest when they restate, not really telling people, oh, by the way, we we actually... You know, our revenue was lower than we reported. Our net income was lower than we reported. Not not notifying. Yeah, there's not a lot of requirements about them reporting it. Right. Or, right. Well, they're, they're, it's their, to their discretion in a lot of yes. cases. If it's not, you know, we don't even have a set threshold. So it's really just do they think they can get away with it or not? So and more and, and more. That's at all high, yeah. all time highs now, right? Is people are they're they're restating the revenues, not telling everybody they did it, and so right. Ever since the requirement started after Enron, it's the lowest percentage. Well, that's what the FASB is for, right? Yeah. Well, that's what the SEC is for, and FASB is part of that. So, yeah. So, what do you want to talk about next? I've got Walmart's roboticization or automation, and I've got the four-day work week. 
I have a little bit on uh, people didn't discuss it with online lenders, but the more I read it, like there's not much new news in there. So we can skip that. So just jump into yours. All right. So real quick, the Finnish prime minister is the youngest female head of government worldwide. And it kind of makes me feel old because she's 34. <laughs> Sana Marin is 34 and she leads a center left coalition, in which all five government parties have women at the top. That's pretty cool. And one of her platforms, one of her goals is to introduce a four day week and a six hour working day in Finland. In her position as Minister of Transport and Communications prior to the election, she said, quote, a four-day work week, a six-hour work day. Why couldn't it be the next step? Is eight hours really the ultimate truth? I believe people deserve to spend more time with their families, loved ones, hobbies, and other aspects of life, such as culture. This could be the next step for us in working life. So, uh, I, yeah. So, will there be ripple effects of that? Because if you think that's only 24 hours. And I think you tweeted out or put on Facebook something about the amount of hours a year a dad spend in the bathroom to avoid their families. <laughs> I did. It's uh, seven hours a year, according to a Which study. Which I feel is very low. Like, is it, <laughs> it'd be interesting to see in Finland if that number increases well, based on these new working hours. Yeah. And I'm a big fan of the idea of a four-day work week or a shorter working day. But see, I think the thing that is not really talked about or the thing that we're missing here is that it doesn't mean that you don't work like at least for knowledge workers it doesn't mean that you're only working 4 days a week or you're only working 6 hours a day to me it just means that that's when you either go into the office or that's when you're supposed to be online and and that way it gives you more flexibility like be with your family take care of your kids you don't need to actually be on you know quote unquote working at your desk 8 hours a day because we're in the knowledge economy and it's it's really just about getting things done right if you can get things done by all means, you know, check out at 3 p.m. Yeah. It would be better. It would be a better law is not putting a requirement of how much people work, is putting a limit on how many meetings you have to attend. Yeah. That that actually, that could actually change the entire world economy. Well, and, and that's the thing is too, is like, I, and why I'm so glad I'm not in uh, an office anymore is just the wasted, pointless meetings that people would have just to fill up their day and make sure their calendar looks busy. You can spend a whole day in meetings and get no work done. And when you're at you home- can. Like that's all that happens. Yeah. You get no work done. Yes. Right. Uh, anyway, I'm excited about this because we'll see. Like, if they actually do it, then we'll see if it makes a difference. It's going to be a, a case study someday. And because we've seen this in certain cities in Sweden, the city of Gothenburg, they did this. They reduced working time to six hours a day in old people's homes and at their municipal hospital while still paying their employees a full salary. And the results were good. So if a whole country does it, I'm going to be really curious to see what happens. And now let's talk about technology that might enable us to work four days a week, which is automation and robotics. Walmart is rushing to catch up with Amazon. They don't have nearly the automation that Amazon has. And you know we've talked about Amazon's warehouses and there's like robots going and picking items and bringing them to workers. Like this is really super futuristic and pretty cool, right? I mean, these robots zooming around the warehouse and going and getting stuff and bringing them to the Amazon uh, people who pack the boxes because we still don't have robots that can pack the boxes without breaking stuff yet. Well, at Walmart, it's in general not as sophisticated. When you order something online on Walmart for a store pickup, the order gets printed out and a person takes it and then they run around the store and they get the items and they pack them up for you and you go pick them up. They bring them out to the curb. And they have that in like a lot of stores, thousands of stores now. But it's not very efficient because a human can only pick about 80 items per hour. And it's really hard to keep your inventory accurate because you've got stuff on the shelves and people are trying to order stuff on the shelves. And you know, like it's hard to keep track of that stuff. It gets moved around the store. People pick it up. They put it somewhere else. You need a better system, right? And that's why Amazon's been beating Walmart. You got to get rid of humans. So Walmart has purchased a system from a company called Alert Innovation. It's a automated warehouse system that they can build in the back warehouse of their stores. And it's called Alphabot. So think of this as a 24 foot tall vending machine with 20,000 square feet of space. It's designed to collect 800 products an hour per workstation. So trucks come and deliver items to Walmart. Workers put the items into Alphabot. They put them into bins and then push them into the machine. I guess they scan the items to say what they are. They put them in the machine and then Alphabot goes and stores them somewhere in that giant cube. And then when somebody orders it online, it goes and fetches the item and brings it to a worker who's standing in one place 
at like this counter where all the items come out on a con- on conveyor belts in these bins. So the worker takes the item out of the box or the bin, puts it in the bag, and then the bin goes away. And this way, the machine can bring 800 items an hour to that worker. And so it makes the worker able to do 10 times the work. And so are we seeing a shift back to an older model retail of stores that died. So in the 80s, you had stores like Service Merchandise, Circuit City, where there were kind of just showrooms and then all the products from the back. And then when you're ready to buy, you'd go up to a counter and it would come off a conveyor belt and it'd be on the counter for you to purchase whatever products you, you were buying right. at that time. Well, like, So it was, it's almost like the pendulum swinging right back, right? So then that makes me think, if you're in the accounting industry, if something's being automated, are there throwbacks to old business models that may have died? 10 years ago, 15 years ago, that almost can be relaunched because of these new automation and technologies that we have available to us. Well, and it's being relaunched with a twist, right? In in this case, yes. now I'm going to go on walmart.com. I order the items online for pickup at the store. So on my way home from work, I drive by the store. I park in the special part of the lot up front and I let them know I'm there and they bring out the items and put them in my car. Right? So I can get like same day delivery essentially just by going to the Walmart instead of waiting for Amazon to bring my box. So that should give Walmart a big competitive advantage. Imagine a future in which the entire warehouse is automated. Like the, this isn't just part of a Walmart. What if the entire store is one of these automated vending machines warehouses essentially? If they can figure out how to make the machines pack the pack the boxes or put stuff in bags, then you would order online, your bags would be packed by the machine and just there in a locker waiting for you to pick them up. There's no, I mean, now they need humans, right? But eventually, maybe they figure out how to automate that part. Currently, the system is in, I think, three stores, one in Oklahoma, another in California. There's one at their headquarters or near their headquarters. They want to have it go to thousands of stores eventually. Yeah, I think I read an article um And this is a while back, eight months ago, an argument or point of view. So just like how Amazon got really good at building servers, right? Mm -hmm. Infrastructure, cloud computing, right? And then they launched Amazon Web Services, which is a huge income maker for Amazon. Is that they're really their play is with all this automation they do with warehouse automation and retail automation is a play to provide this for others. So Target will be like, hey, we want to have robots basically build what you're just talking about. And Target could build it from scratch or they could just spin it up as needed from Amazon. Mm -hmm. And Amazon will actually just empower all of this for a bunch of other retailers instead of just themselves. It's a thought. Because then they win all retail. They they win all retail without having to win retail. Well, I think we're out of time this week, David. The hour just flies by. So if people want to get in touch with you, where can they do that? The easiest way is on Twitter, at David Leary. And what about yourself, Blake? I'm at Blake T. Oliver. And you can email me at Blake at BlakeOliver.com. And if you want to let us know what you think, do us a favor, write us a review. We will look for that review. We will read it on the air. So you can tell us what you think about what we're talking about, any stories you think we missed. We always check our Twitter and email, but we don't always remember to talk about stuff on the show. But if you write a review, uh, we will definitely mention that. Yeah, we have a process for that. Those don't get missed. We have a workflow. All right. Until next week. We'll see everybody next week. Time for the classifieds. Looking to modernize your firm? Ryan Lanzanis started and sold his own accounting firm in just five years. Now he helps firms like yours stay on the cutting edge. Get access to his free weekly email curating the top five pieces of content that will help your firm modernize by visiting futurefirm.co slash cloud accounting. That is futurefirm.co slash cloud accounting. Want to get the word out about your newsletter, webinar, party, Facebook group, podcast, or that fancy Excel macro you just created? Why not let the listeners of the Cloud Accounting Podcast know by running a classified ad? Hit the show notes for the link to get more info.